Conflict over public education has been a prominent part of American political debate for the last two years, particularly in state level politics. Many of the battles are focused on the question of how controversial topics like race, gender, or sexuality should be talked about in public schools and who should make decisions about what teachers can and should discuss. Welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today, we'll explore why these disputes have become such a prominent part of American politics and what it would take to resolve the controversies involved. I'm Sam Weaver, a junior fellow at ARI, and with me today is Ankar Gatte, senior fellow at ARI. Hi, Ankar. Hi, Sam. Let's get started by discussing some of the background, uh, what is, how these issues are coming up in American politics today. I think probably the most prominent manifestation of, of these debates, the one that people are most likely to be familiar with, is the debate over uh, state laws or, or bills that uh, conservatives are pushing for promoting in a lot of states around the country, trying to restrict the teaching of controversial topics in public schools. Uh, these, are, these are the so-called anti-critical race theory laws. Um, which have been passed in over 15 states. And they have other kind of legislative uh, priorities as well, uh, attempts to restrict instruction about sexuality or gender issues, um, laws about library books. And they've also promoted uh, legislation to increase transparency around what is being taught in public schools, uh, legislation that requ would require syllabus and book lists to be posted online, uh, even in some cases, bills that would have t uh, cameras be placed in classrooms so that parents could see what's going on in classes. Um, and the conservatives who are promoting the, sorry, do you want to? No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the conservatives who are calling for these, uh, this, leg this type of legislation are saying this is needed in response to uh, attempts by people on the left to uh, use the public schools to indoctrinate children with uh, certain uh, ideas associated with the political left around gender, race, sexuality. Um, and I think there's probably something to to that idea. Um, but this is the uh, this is how they want to respond is by passing these laws uh, at the state level that try to control what's what's going on in the in the individual public schools um so i think the situation is that there's um attempts by people inside the system it's hard to tell exactly how widespread or systematic uh people who tend more to the political left um thinking that they have certain ideas certain beliefs that should be taught in the classroom and conservatives trying to restrict those beliefs and trying to promote their beliefs, their ideas uh, through these kind of state state laws. Uh, so we have a situation where there's uh, political warfare over the, the content of public education, um, attempts to control uh, the, the public school classrooms and uh, particularly to control what is being said, what teachers can or should or do say about uh, kind of the controversial political issues of the day, the race issues, gender issues, uh, things like that. Uh, was there something you wanted to add to this description? Yeah. So what's your, your, you have a special interest in education. So you've been reading about this. What's your sense of well, two, two things, how much of this dates after the George Floyd protest, and you could say post-pandemic, versus how many, how much of the this type of legislation do you think was in the works even before that? And um, related to that, in talking about it as public schools and so, on, I think probably the most prominent in terms of hitting the headlines is Florida with DeSantis and what uh, some of the legislation passed there, which is targeted at elementary schools. So it, it like we're talking about a pretty early 
level or an age of education. But when you're looking, you said th there's these laws across now 15 states. Are they, is, is Florida an outlier in that it's targeting young kids and, and it's like focused on the education of young kids versus say high school students? Or do you think, no, it, like there's a lot of variation across these state laws? Sure. So on the first point, I think the uh, the whole 2020 George Floyd protest, nation, nationwide protest movement was definitely a, a turning point of, in some in some way in in the amplification of these these political fights about education. I think a lot of the initial reaction by people in in education teachers, administrators who have you know, left-wing political uh, inclinations who, who were inclined to think, who, to react to the, the whole George Floyd and all the protests by saying what we really need, what this shows is that we really need to do more uh, to teach children about racism and, you know, raise them to be anti-racist and uh, there was um, what you could see a concentrated effort to get more sort of anti-racist doctrine, anti-racist teaching into public schools by, by educators who are kind of on the political left. And I think a, a lot of the, um, the conservative bills, the kind of the, were kind of the backlash to that, um, to, to the, the left becoming more out in the open about saying we need to get our ideas into schools. Um, and I think, I, so I think the conservative backlash started mostly after the Floyd protests. I think it really came into prominence in the spring of 2021. Um, mm -hmm. But the, there has been a, there is a long history of people on both sides trying to influence the, the teaching of these topics. And then on the, the issue of age, age range, uh, I, I think that, so the conservative laws, the kind of Republican laws and bills are pretty wide open about what age range they're dealing with. I, I mean, they're, they're trying to basically do a couple of things, which is to tr to ban the teaching of certain ideas or certain concepts, and it's a pretty vague what they actually what those actually are in a lot of cases. Uh, but that those bans are not limited to a particular age group at all. Uh, in fact, some of the controversy that has come up around some of these is that they seem to also apply to college and the way that. Uh, the way that First Amendment is interpreted uh, as applying to academic freedom, the freedom of educators to teach what they want to teach, it's interpreted differently for colleges versus K-12. So these are very broad reaching bills that don't tend to specify an age range. Um, I said the one thing they're doing is banning certain, I certain ideas or certain concepts. The other thing is to require the teaching of both sides of certain debated historical issues, although that's also vague. Um, and it's worth and saying that just, the... I was going to say, even just the idea that it's there's two sides, as though it, when you're looking at history, the issues to think of our current fights between political left and political right, as though like those are the only two viewpoints. It, I mean, that in itself is telling you something that, that about these debates that is very problematic. Yeah. And one other thing on the issue of age groups, uh, it is worth noting that in kind of the left-wing push to get more anti-racism in education that kind of came up in mid to late 2020, a lot of that was pretty explicitly targeted at elementary age children, at, at really young children trying to get them to be aware of racial issues and uh, that incorporated certain uh, controversial left-wing interpretations or, or frameworks for understanding racism, like the 
kind of the privilege framework and things like that. Uh, so it was it, it, these fights, even though kind of the issues of race, gender, sounds like more secondary education issues, a lot of the controversy is about how they are coming up in elementary classrooms. I mean, the, the same kind of comes up with sexuality because there's controversy about, well, what if there's a, a gay teacher who talks about his family? Is that, is that okay? And there, the laws are pretty vague on that. Uh, so it, it, a lot of this is affecting elementary age as well as the later years. Um, so, the, so the, just to summarize one aspect of this, the, it's when you see the news coverage and particularly the more, um, mainstream, say like a CNN kind of coverage, it, it, it's often that the conservatives are making much ado about nothing. Your view, I mean, it's, it's my view too, but, but I take it your view is that, no, there is a push to try to get some of this, a, a certain ideological framework, a certain way of looking at some of these controversial issues. There is a push to get that more into the curriculum of elementary and secondary education. Yes, I think so. Um, it, it's not as uh, out in the open concerted movement as the conservative responses. I, I mean, I think it was more open in the immediate aftermath of the Floyd protests. But it, it, in general, I think the people who are in public education, I mean, the people who are teachers and administrators, I would hazard a guess that the majority of them by a pretty significant amount have have left wing political sympathies. And uh, so it's harder to sort of measure their the impact of them bringing idea their ideas into the classroom, whereas the conservatives are doing this more from the outside parent campaigns, uh, state legislatures. Uh, but there's there's evidence that at least to some to some extent, there's there's an effort to bring uh, left wing frameworks into classrooms. And if you think of it from this perspective, that higher education, so our colleges and universities, have a definite ideological bent to them that would be put as it's left leaning. Um, that it's, I mean, there have been many studies of this, of conservatives and Republicans, their representation in terms of the fact on the faculty and administration of colleges and universities, it's very small. And anyone who has some experience, I, mean, I got a bachelor's, master's and a PhD, it's obvious that it, that higher education is dominated by a certain, um, uh, like a camp of approaches. It's not they all have exactly the same view, but there's a similarities in their view. Um, and they're, that anybody's sort of pro free market, pro capitalism, just to take a political issue. There's not many on university campuses. And if teachers, most teachers are being educated at universities, and then they go into secondary school, high schools and elementary schools, and so on, it wouldn't, it should not be surprising that if you then look at them and think, like, do, is there a kind of bias here? Um, or at least is there a, a kind of dominant viewpoints? I think the answer is yes. And so you put it, it's not as much out in the open. I think in a certain way it's out in the open, but it's not as much as though it's a program because there's an element that they take it. And this is, it's, it's, you see this the same on university campuses as like, this is just common sense. Everybody knows that who thinks different than this, because in their environment, it is that everybody or not everybody, but like, like this is the dominant viewpoint. So they, there's a way in which they think of it as just, okay, we're just furthering what education and proper education is like. Whereas if you're pushing back against it, it's more, it's, oh yeah, no, we have to gather and have protests and form some groups and so on. And so the reporting focuses on that and doesn't focus on just, look, there's a kind of mainstream 
uh, dominant viewpoint on these issues. And the more they think they have to t teach these issues, that's the line they're going to take on the issues because that's what they've been taught and that's what most think. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it should not be surprising what is going on. Yeah. yeah. So one question we could ask in trying to understand what's going on here, uh, what's behind these, this, these political battles and this trend um, is, I mean, what strikes me is it's a little strange that this is the focus in concern about education, that this is the thing that when people are debating or trying to propose political initiatives around education, that this is what they would focus on. So the, the kind of controversial things are like, how, are, how is racism talked about in American history classes? Or how, did, how does the teacher address it with the students when there's a, a gay or transgender student in the class or something like that? The, these are the kind of issues that the debate about education is focused on right now. Uh, and the, the activists on both sides of this debate would, would say that they're concerned about the interests, the well-being of children, children getting a good education. But I think when you look at the state of American public education, it's, it's strange to think that this is what would be your top set of priorities if you're concerned about the quality of children's education and children getting the uh, learning the things they need and getting the education they need to succeed in their future lives. Because, I mean, it's no uh, no big surprise to pretty much anyone that American public education is performing really poorly and is performing really poorly on on basic fundamentals like teaching children to read. I it, you can look at any of the the test scores, what percentage of children can read at their grade level, uh, even how that compares internationally to other countries. It's, it's a really bad state of affairs. And so I would think that if someone was concerned about, if, if their main concern was, are children getting a good education in the public schools? Is, is what they're learning what they need to be learning? Uh, that the focus would be more on trying to fix a system that is really failing on just the most basic educational issues. Uh, but the, the debates uh, that we see make national headlines about education are not focused on methods of teaching reading or uh, mathematics or things like this. It's instead really focused on these, uh, these heavily controversial political issues that uh, are prominent in our political political debate, but are not the core issues that I think of when I'm thinking of education and what, what makes the most difference in whether or not children learn what they need to be learning. So it, it prompts me to ask and, and wonder what is, what is really behind these campaigns? Is it, is it just that these people really think that, that these are the most important issues in education? Or is there something else that's driving the emphasis on these, how race and gender are going on and in schools as compared to other issues they could be, uh, could be focusing on? Yeah, I, th I think that's an important point. And it's part of the reason to put it, as, so you put it as political warfare. And you could, as against what? Well, you could make it like it's an educational warfare. It's a big dispute about what the nature of education is, how it should happen, what is proper versus improper education. But that does not seem to be what either side or, or and there's more than two sides here, what anybody is really focusing on. And it's not that it's driven by the media. If you take, again, I think probably the most prominent thing here is DeSantis in Florida. It's not as though um, you could say, well, like, what are DeSantis's educational policies? I think we're, we're way 
be below the point in politics where anybody has any principles. But a policy is like, here's something that I'm trying to implement that this is what I, how I think, uh, given that we have state run education, this is how it should run. Here's a set of policies, but you don't even get that. It's just, here's some things that I want to ban some books and ban these topics from being talked about and so on. But what is, what are you trying to accomplish? And what are your policies? You don't have a sense of that. And you don't have a sense of the people who are, are uh, vocal in trying to bash DeSantis and say he's crazy. It's so to, to, um, that it's not focused on education and you put it, it's not focused on the basics. One way to think about that is kind of more broadly than just the issue of race and gender and so on is you should, I think anyone in education and particularly primary and, and uh, elementary and, and, and high school education, the idea that what the education should be about and particularly when it's government run and government controlled education, it should be about teaching controversial subjects where there's not an agreed upon body of knowledge and viewpoints and, and that's what the education should be doing as against teaching fundamentals where there's an agreed upon body of knowledge. And if students are not learning and mastering that, all your focus should be like, put aside every controversial subject about history, about um, economics, about we're not teaching that until they have an understanding of uh, an ability to read, to write, to do math, to do science, to know some of the um, um, kind of f fundamental issues in the humanities, in history, in in literature, the idea that it's oh, what what they really need is to learn controversial things where there's not a settled body of knowledge. It's you're not thinking about education if that's what your focus is. As you say, when it's it it's evident that our schools, if not failing are way below optimal in and then just if you compare our public education to public education in other countries it's like america's not leading in regard to that and if your focus is not on that it's on this kind of thing it tells you yeah it, it, what's driving this is not really a concern about our children being educated properly yeah so then, then what, what i what, hear what is Right. And I think we should turn to that. Uh, so what I hear in the kind of the concerns about indoctrination and the, the, uh, the other side isn't trying to indoctrinate our children is um, kind of a, a, a desire or a, a concern about the control over what future generations are going to think on these controversial issues, what positions they're going to hold. I, I mean, you sort of hear it in the the calls on the left to have more anti-racist training and education after the the floyd protests it's there's a concern of we need to shape how the next generation thinks about race and then in the conservative backlash to, on all of these issues it seems like there's a real concern that uh oh if the, if my children and all the children in the, the country go to these public schools with uh these these progressive left-wing educators, they're going to indoctrinate all the children to believe as they do. And then the, the next generation is going to agree with the, the other side. And, and we're going to sort of lose in the, in the broader kind of culture war or political arena, uh, if, however you want to call it. Um, it I mean, it, it strikes me as a kind of a tribalistic, uh, desire to uh, make to sort of win victories against the other tribe by ensuring that that you have control over how the next generation thinks. I mean, that's how they would put it. I, I think there's something a little off about that perspective, but the, the idea that if you control the schools and you put in your ideas that you're in you're in some way ensuring that the next generation is going to uh, align with you politically, culturally. Uh, and if the other side 
instead is in control that that they're going to win over the next generation and and that that's what strikes me as a uh um a real motivating factor in this and and why are you why do you think of it as it's it's tribal because I, I think that's right uh, that there, there's a tribal element to that but I'm, I'm interested in what, what you think about that because it, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really seem to have much of an intellectual component it's not about teaching children how to like think through the issues or to form a philosophic worldview it's it's much more about are they going to learn uh, the beliefs of the left or the beliefs of the right and it, it there's sort of this perspective that the teachers will promote certain ideas and the children will just come out believing them uh, so there's sort of a, a not very intellectual perspective here and it's coming from a idea that uh we have to like we're at we're at war with this other group of people in the in the country and we need to uh in, ensure that we are in power and not them and because if they're in power something awful will happen and we're the good guys and we're going to do it right and so the schools are sort of a nexus of power in this struggle because it's the raising of the next generation and so uh, if we if we take control of the schools then uh we'll have the upper hand whereas if they take control of the schools they're they're going to win in the and win power in the future but it's not about like winning in terms of getting a, a clear like a intellectual perspective uh people to accept that instead it's about getting people to accept certain beliefs and opinions and tendencies that are sort of bundled together. It's, it's not obvious to me that like there's a, there's, I don't see like an integrated view that either one it's pushing. It's just sort of the things that we believe in the things that other people believe. Yeah. It has a quasi religious element to it an atmosphere to it that it's more, you put it is about beliefs. It's more, it leans more on the side of indoctrination than of explanation and reasoning and convincing people of things. And I think that's on both sides. So if you think of it as sort of, you put it earlier as, a, as a, there's a kind of Republican, conservative, red state backlash here. And when it's, we're banning talking about these concepts and we're banning these books and so on to any thinking student they see that that like that's not intellectual that's not educational that you just say well well we can't talk about this or i can't read that book and when you start to get a little older children the idea of telling some a child like a teenager you can't read this book you're just incentivizing that okay there must be something there that adults think i can't to do and I want to get this book that is banned and so on. Um, so it, I mean, I think it's stupid just in terms of tactic when you get to a level of where a child is thinking more for themselves and thinking, yeah, you're going to ban me from reading this, then I'm going to read it because there must be something that you think is like is too dangerous that if I knew and so on. Um, but it, it, it's not intellectual and, and the kind of situation you brought up, like, what do you do if you, there's a teacher who's gay? And he's got family photos in um, on his desk or something. And the kid asks about and he, about that. He's passed the law that he can't talk about it. Then it like he feels like a hypocrite, and he's and he's lying to the students. The student easily will pick up that he's being given some line of BS and something. And like the idea that that's intellectual educational. No, that's we're trying to indoctrinate and. Um, sort of tailor everything that they so they don't come to a different conclusion, but it's the same on the other side, and particularly you said, which I I, I think that's certainly been my impression that it's um, we have to get the next generation to in quotes think correctly about this, and so we need to get them earlier, and part of it when you're thinking of and and I mean this has been part of what the debate 
has been about this at, at a primary elementary school level. And there's a question, like, why would you even be thinking of this as a subject that's appropriate? Like you're talking about sexuality um, to a seven-year-old or a six-year-old. It, it's, they're not in a position to think about and understand. So if you're thinking of it as reasoning and cognitive and knowledge, they're not in a position to. But if you sort of, um, you put it like there's a whole set of things about attitudes and so if you inculcate, but this is the inculcation indoctrination that you're supposed, like you can get a young child, you're supposed to think something like this. You don't know the reasons for it and so on, but like this is what's respectable and the other things aren't respectable. You can impact a child. Um, they can do things to get out of that as they as they become more in control of their mind and thinking. As like, no, you didn't really give me a reason for this. No. But there's a reason like religions want to get children early. Um, they because they know what I'm doing is indoctrinating and it works better if I get people earlier. Um, and so you see that it's it's not just on the conservative side. If anything, it's more on the side of um, the the people pushing this in the schools. And it's certainly not the only element of indoctrination that goes on. I think of uh, the, by far the most prominent is for environmental issues, where the same thing happens. They take very young kids and t want to supposedly teach them about pollution and global warming. So they don't have any knowledge to be able to really think about these issues, to think about the evidence, so on. And, that's indoctrination. That's and that tells you it's like again, it's not really about education. It's something else, and that like is a real tribal element to this. And it's clear that it's not really about the interests of the children because it's how could it be in the interest of the children to just believe things, have no idea why, ha haven't they haven't learned to think, they haven't actually processed these ideas. They just were told. The, this is the way it is when they were six years old and like that's that's not what it would look like to take seriously what a good education would look like i a good edu good education yeah, it, would it, teach it, the children to think yeah it's a real disrespect for the the students and for what that you're supposed to be educating them um and so the, the i mean this unfortunately is what happens when it becomes more tribal but the idea of young kids as political footballs it should be revolting to anybody who actually thinks about the interests and welfare and happiness of children that like they're playthings in a political battle it's, yeah. so we've talked some about the role of tribalism uh in this and to kind of turn a little bit more to the the aspect of this, that this is a government run system. Um, I, I think that the fact that this is a government run system that monopolizes almost all of education in this country. Yeah, there are private schools, but they're it's only a pretty small minority of children go to private schools. Uh, my sense is that that having this monopoly run by by governments invites tribal warfare and promotes the sort of these tribal political battles because uh, it's in a, in a in a particular state say there's almost all the children are going to one set one set of schools that are run by a centralized body and uh there's a lot of power to be had in terms of being able to promote your ideas and, or promote your views and influence future generations, if that's your goal, by getting control of that body. And then, but then I think there's also a concern by, by parents uh, that if, if, I, if I don't lobby, if I don't try to influence the public schools, somebody else will. I mean, that's part of the dynamic here is that the, the arguments that each side is making are the other side is trying to control education. So you need to promote us 
to be in control of education. Uh, and it, the, like the whole dynamic where there's going to be one uh, centralized body making one set of decisions for all of the students. And it's a political body that that is elected and holds the, the power to take taxpayer money and send it to these schools. Uh, it it leads to this dynamic where where people experience the the need to have some influence on that on that body that, that decision making body or, or else who knows what's going to happen with their children's education assuming they can't afford the private schools or something like that uh, so i think there there's really uh, a a synergy between the tribalism of our culture generally and the fact that this is a centrally government run system uh, that leads to this sort of really intense political warfare, everybody trying to pressure, uh, use political pressure to get their way in the schools. Yeah, you, you put it, it's a synergy, it's a negative synergy. So it's you, another way to put that same point is it sets up a vicious cycle. Um, so there are virtuous cycles that things get better when you're iterating and it get it's you're reaching higher and higher levels. And a vicious cycle is when it goes lower and lower and lower. And there's yeah, there's a, I think it's right that there's a dynamic between um, having giving government control over education in the way that the uh, U.S. government has been given control over education, particularly from the late 19th into the 20th and, and 21st century. It's not that government, uh, U.S. government always had this level of control over public education. And it's particularly K through 12. It has less control. It still has a lot of control over higher education, college, universities but it has less control than it has over um, K through 12 education. And if, it, if you've set it up like that, then it encourages people, you, you put it as there's um, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a public um, pressure group warfare, there's jockeying for, well, if, if what are the schools going to teach and so on. That's inherent in a government system. When you've made it that w you're going to have elected officials who decide all these things for everybody. It's not they're deciding it for their children. It's not they're deciding it just for the people who voted for them. It's they're deciding it also for the people who voted against them and voted for other candidates. And now when you make a government decision like this, it's a decision that is binding on everyone. And so inherent in that is to set up, okay, well, there's going to be pressure groups that it's, we have to now band together to try to get our view and how we think education will proceed. Because if we don't, other people are going to do that and they're going to vote for their candidates and so on. So inherent is pressure groups. And when it becomes more, when your just culture is becoming more tribal, the groups are much less about ideal ideology and much less about like, we've got the right ideas. So of course, our ideas should be what's governing in education, or it should be governing for how transportation works, or how healthcare to take another element of the economy, it's heavily government um, controlled. It's it, when you get tribal, it's not even about yeah we've got the right ideas. It's we want our ideas, and our set of beliefs and customs and traditions. And so because to rule, because otherwise you're going to put your customs and traditions and on us. And it, and it is, um, it, to, to think of it, when, when one thinks of it as tribal, it's, and we talked about this in part, that it's not educational. It's not about convincing. It's not about reasoning. And then if you think of tribes that it's, and, and sort of the history of the human race with tribes, Tribes constantly clash and they fight and literally like they physically fight. And here we set up a system that it's your to say you're imposing yours is 
to say you're forcing other people to abide by this. And that just the allure of force attracts someone who's not um, at all reticent about using force. Like I don't, I find the whole thing unsavory in part because I have no interest. I have very definite views about education, what proper education looks like, what improper education. I have no desire to force that on other people. But a tribalist doesn't feel that. It's, it's everything's about force. It's just you impose your will on other people or they impose their will on you. And so it, he has no real conception of freedom. And so, and that's part of the vicious circle. You've set up a system where force rules. It's I get to enforce and you're, you incentivize that the people who like to use force um, are the people who are going to jockey to get into positions of power here. And it seems per particularly dangerous that the issues that force is being injected into are intellectual issues. They're issues of what is the right approach to education, what what subjects should be taught, and then what is the truth within those subjects? Like, what is the right way to interpret American history? That That's a very intellectual issue. It's It requires a lot of thought and uh it's certainly not a, a settled issue either but that these are issues that um that people have to have to think about and have to be free to think about if they're going to follow reason and and uh, try to arrive at the truth in in these issues and when you have force as a as a factor um, a controlling factor and how these are actually being implemented how the ideas people come to in education whether you can implement your ideas it depends on whether you have the favor of the people currently in charge and whoever is in charge is whoever has the, has the power of the state right now uh gets to promote their ideas to 90 percent of the school 90 plus percent of the schools uh without having to argue and convince the teachers or the parents, uh, the parents that are paying for it and the other taxpayers who are paying for it, that these are the right ideas, that these ideas are true, that they that they are supported by reason. Uh, so I, it's, it seems particularly dangerous that these issues that people should be thinking about and debating and trying to persuade each other of using reason, uh, you now have this huge injection of force picking winners and losers, suppressing certain ideas that the people in, in power don't like, and uh, basically just in, inhibiting, preventing people from uh, doing the things that, that they would need to do to, to arrive at the truth, to arrive at the right perspective and, and act on it in all sorts of issues that touch on education. Yes, it's particularly dangerous and it's particularly um, galling that, that it, so it's, it's obvious to people, even if they can't articulate it, that there's something really wrong with the idea that we're going to enforce education. Um, that education is supposed to be you've convinced someone, you've persuaded them, you don't need threats, you don't need force. If you've convinced someone of something, then it's, oh yeah, I, I see that you're right, I'm going to do the same. I have the, I'm going to have the same view and I'm going to act accordingly and so on. It's, you don't need a, a gun if you're able to convince and to persuade. And education, um, certainly, I mean, from in the context of America, in the context of a free country. Education, yeah, it's about convincing and it's about persuading. So, like, why do we need laws to pass? Um, this is what's going to be taught and that's what's going to be taught and this is banned. And that, if, it's, if you can show people, like, this is right and that's wrong, what do you need a law for? And so when you start getting to the level of, oh, no, we're passing laws. That this is what you have to teach. You're not allowed to teach that. You can't read this. It, people get the sense that it's, even if they can't, again, articulate it, that it's, 
Like this is anti-education. There's there's some deep contradiction here, and they're right that there, there is a deep contradiction here. And the deep contradiction is um, education is the understood, not the obeyed. It's the province of reason, not of force. And so when you inject the idea that no, it's about voting. And then the winning side imposes their standards, their views, their curriculum on everybody. You're that's antithetical to the actual nature of education. I I also think it's it's antithetical to the founding ideas of the United States. Uh, when you think about like freedom of thought, freedom of speech, that one of the founding ideas in this country was the separation of church and state, the idea that uh, you should be free to make your own decisions about what you believe in, in religious matters. You should be free to think, to think through the issues yourself, arrive at your own conclusions and act on them rather than having certain beliefs or practices be imposed on you by the government. And even without the government taxing you to support certain ideas that it's chosen as worthy of support. So you, if you think about like the way that it is in, in England where there is a state church and yeah, nobody has to believe in that. They, they can choose what to believe, but they, they do have to pay for the, the state church. And in the American founding I, is a pretty important part of, of that to say, no, we're not going to have anything like that. We're not going to impose on you in the way that you think about religion. And we're not going to make you support a religious institution that you don't agree with. Um, but th the issue seems very similar in education, that these are intellectual issues that people should be free to think through and they need to be free to think them through themselves and follow the evidence if they're to arrive at the truth. But when you have a system of, of government run education, uh, then you have a situation where people are being forced to sponsor a certain set of ideas, a certain set of conclusions, whether or not they have those ideas agree with their own. Uh, so it's, it's, there's something really off about having, or something really wrong about having a system of taxpayer funded education in the country that was founded on the separation of church and state, among other ideas. Yes, all the arguments, or let's put it, all the good arguments for a separation of church and state apply in spades to a separation of education and state. So if you think of the First Amendment as separating church and state, it says the government cannot establish religion. So it can't get involved in pushing some particular religion or three religions. Like, we're, we're, yeah, we like Judaism, Christianity. We don't like Islam or Hinduism. So we're funding these two and not the other two and taking money from Hindus to fund Jews and so on. Um, you, can, you can't have an establishment and it can't interfere with the free exercise of religion. And it should be exactly the same in education that it cannot establish any educational viewpoint curriculum and that includes funding it and so in the way that the the courts have at least in, in in the 20th century interpreted what it means to establish it's like it can't make any even small steps towards establishing it should be the same in education and from the other direction it's that the government should not be able to interfere with the free exercise of education. So people want to set up schools and so on. It, it, that should be, people are free to do that. And it's not for the government to try to prevent that or say, it's, oh, well, we don't like this school or that school. So we're going to interfere with the, you setting that school up. Um, but the, but uh, the tragedy in the U S history in regard to this is this I don't think is understood really at an explicit level by the founding fathers and even someone like Jefferson, who I think has the Jefferson and Madison have the best understanding of the principles 
that generate the First Amendment, they, um, or put, let's put it, Jefferson is, yeah, we could have public education. That's a contradiction in the basic ideals that they're articulating and a specific viewpoint. And there have been other contradictions in American history, like severe contradictions, the, mo the most glaring of which was slavery. But in regard to slavery, we got a better view. I mean, it led to the Civil War that this is an untenable contradiction. You can't say all men are equal and have equal rights and so on and say, yeah, you some, but some can own slaves and make slaves of others. Like, it's just, you can't live with that contradiction. And we got something better after the Civil War. It was, yeah, we're getting rid of slavery. What happened with regard to education is there were people pushing, no, you need more public education. You need more government control of education. And instead of getting the sort of res trying to resolve this contradiction by saying, oh, no, we need something like the First Amendment in regard to education. It's, oh, yeah, no, government should be involved more and more in education. And that happens in the 19th and then into the 20th century. The progressives really push this, but it's not only the progressives. And so it, it became worse. So I, I think it, it's right that it's, it's not consistent with the American ideals. That wasn't fully understood even by the founding fathers. And instead of resolving this contradiction in a good direction, we've in effect resolved, I mean, it's not resolved because it's, but it, it's, um, we've gone in the other direction of handing more and more power to government over education. And that surely had a really negative impact on the quality of education uh, that exists uh, because it's, you, when you have that level of government control, you end up stifling people's ability to, to think and innovate and come up with new ideas and test them and uh, think of radically new approaches that haven't been tried before and, and experiment with them. And I think if we didn't have that, uh, if, if things had gone very differently in the historical development, if that contradiction had been resolved in a better way, uh, we'd probably have a really uh, vibrant marketplace in education with a lot of uh, a lot of different approaches, a lot of choice, and uh, things that we probably can't even imagine in terms of new ideas and uh, new ways of doing things. And of course, we wouldn't have uh, this situation where children are being used as pawns in a tribal political battle uh, because if you don't have a, a government run education system it's then up to parents to look at schools uh, and choose the one that they think is right so there's no issue of uh, are my ideas being imposed on somebody else or somebody else's ideas being imposed on me it's it's up to the the choice of the the individual families Yes, and it, it's worth underlying that you put it, there's probably things we couldn't dream of. I would take out the prob probably, it, and it's worth underlining that, that it's when people think, oh, um, so you want to get rid of government control over education. They think of it as, oh, so education would look the same, but now it's just in private hands versus in government hands. That's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is it's no longer governed by force. And in, now it's governed by reason and persuasion. And so people have to figure out, like, what actually is education? What is its value? What's the best way to pursue it? How much education does somebody need? What are the forms in which that takes? And there, there, what happens is there will be so much thinking in regard to that because it's now no longer it's just someone can come along and say, well, no, I'm going to force everything be done in this way. And so it, it, it requires and it incentivizes thinking about this. And when you unleash a rational mind in an area, it's you get one, you get progress, but you get all kinds of things that are works of um, supreme intelligence and even genius that nobody could uh, foresee. So at, to, like, take a small example of this. The telecommunication industry 
was heavily government controlled in the 60s and so and then there was some no, certainly not complete but some decontrolling of it of privatizing it but which means now it's no longer governed by force it's gov people are able to think about this stuff. and you get all kinds of innovations in the telecommunications industry and the idea that somebody in the 60s could pr predict that oh you're going to have a smartphone in the 2000s and stuff. No, that like this is part of what happens on a market. But the reason it happens is now people are free to think and implement their ideas and try to persuade other people that this is a good idea and you could build on this idea and you can open an app store and there's all third party people. And it's you can't predict what a market is going to do because you can't predict the thinking that people are going to engage in what they're going to figure out and so what they're going to innovate. And that, so education, if it was not government controlled, would not look anything like what it looks today. And that's a good thing. Um, uh, and it, and part of the, it's sort of in the philosophical impetus for public government controlled education is it comes from a collectivist egalitarian perspective that they want everyone the same. They want it, it it's, um, and this is the, it's often put that the educational system that the progressives sort of pushed into America comes from Germany. And it comes from this kind of, like we've got a government straight jacket, everyone's gonna be like a soldier for the national cause and so on. It, 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 so it's not a bug, it's a feature that everything be the same and uh and ultimately what that means is drag down to the same level versus incredible innovation in the field um and it like if one if you want education to resemble the u.s tech industry um what you need is freedom so we've talked about what education would look like if we had freedom. And I think it's very clear that uh, the way to really solve the issues that we see in education today is to bring freedom to education, stop having the government run schools transition to a, a, a free market in education. But, and we only have a few minutes left. I think we should talk some about what can be done today with regard to the issues that we were talking about earlier in the podcast because I don't think we're going to get to a, a free system in education anytime soon. Our, our position on this is not popular to say the least. Uh, so what, what can we say about uh, how to handle things in the context of having a government run system? Are there better or worse ways uh, to make decisions about these sort of controversial topics, like ways that we could improve things and and lessen the issue of political battles over education, indoctrination, uh, these things that people are really concerned about for, for some good reasons. Um, yeah, I think there's a variety of things. I would put them all under the vein. So I agree with you that it's much too early to get a lot of people on board with education should be free and so if it put it in terms of the way we're talking about before, there should be a separation of education and state in the same way and for the same reasons as a separation of church and state. It's too early for to have a large uh, portion of the American public to agree with that. But the I think part of what should be done is the introducing various elements of freedom and one way of thinking about that is what we talked about a little bit before the higher education in america is still freer than k through 12 and to think like are but it's still like heavily government controlled subsidized i mean the, 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 we have this now another kind of political battle about forgiving student loan debt. I mean, that just shows you the level that um, government 
uh, funding and control, because control follows funding, that in higher education, I mean, because most of that debt is for college and university. Uh, so it's not as though it's free, but in comparison to K through 12, it's freer. And anything that can be done to make K through 12 look more like American higher education, those are things that I think politicians could push and that they might get actual reception on the part of the American population. Um, and and there, there's various things like the power of the teachers unions and K through 12 is a huge problem in order to be able to um, improve the, the content and, and nature of the education. The way in which uh, the funding is tied to uh, geography that it's so it's basically property taxes and so every home listing list like we're in this school district it's a great school district and so on, because you're tied like if you buy a house you're tied to that those set of schools and so on. there's no reason for that it, it's similar it's a massive distortion in the same way that the in healthcare that healthcare is tied to your job and so people when they're thinking of changing jobs and so on it's well what happens to my health care and so on the, those should be independent issues in the way that you don't think about what happens to my car insurance when I change jobs because they're not, it's not tied to the job. And so, so there's, there's various kinds of controls at K through 12 that it would be useful to start decontrolling. And you can do that without it's what you get is full freedom. So that's one element. There's others, I think, but that's one. So the idea that is to have more, choice have more options for parents to to choose from and to have and to not have it be so much that uh your education your children's educational experience is determined top down by the the people in charge of the state or the district and it's determined entirely by where you live and you just that's just what you get and whoever's in power gets to decide everything for everybody that having more more options, more variation, even within the public system to the extent that's possible? Yeah, I think that's part of it, though. I don't conceptualize these things in terms of choice because you can make all kinds of artificial choices. I think it's much better to think of it in terms of control. Um, so who's controlling this? Is the government controlling this or are um, in, in this case, I mean, one contrast is, do parents have control over it? Do parents have con more control over where they send their kids? Do they have more control about um, what goes on in the schools? You, you brought up earlier about some of the laws are pushing for transparency. And some of that I think is proper it, to, to understand if, if, if these are going to be government run, as we've said, they should not in the end be government run if you want a truly American system. But if they're to be government run, government in essence should be transparent. You should know what is being taught in schools and why. Uh, what are the textbooks that are gonna be used and, and um, what the subject matter will be, why this these subjects are being selected and so on. There are areas of government where secrecy is important, military, obviously, police investigations on, but the default is government, they're supposed to be our representatives and agents, and it should be transparent. I don't think that what follows is cameras in elementary school rooms and so on, but that you understand this is what's going to be on the, the curriculum and so on, and that a parent could then say, no, I'm trying to send my kid to a different school. They're like, if this is this school's what they're teaching and so on. And that's giving, that's control. Um, and I think it, it's the more you're taking control away from the government and giving it to individuals uh, is good. And, the, but the same even, it's that it, that you need federal control over education. Why do you need that? Um, and that if it's more state and local, and again, not tied to geography, like that only in real estate and so on, you would have more variation, but put it, putting it from the way I'm looking at it, it's 
individual citizens would have more control. They wouldn't have full freedom, but they'd have more control than they currently have. And that it's that's what I think one should be pushing for. Well, we are about at time. Uh, so I think we should start wrapping up now, unless you have any final thoughts. Um, no, I think this, this makes sense. This is a good, good point to wrap up. Great. All right. Uh, so after, right after this show ends, there will be a session on Clubhouse. I know I'm going to be there. I'm not sure, Ankar, are you going to be on Clubhouse as well? I can join for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So if you uh, watching this and you have uh, any questions you want to ask about this issue, join us on Clubhouse right after this ends and we'll, we will continue the conversation there for a little while. Um, I want to also thank the people who uh, donated super chats to us during the show. Uh, we really appreciate your support. It helps us keep doing podcasts like this. Uh, also another good way to support us is to uh, like and share um the show uh, and to comment uh on youtube because that does boost the algorithm and uh, help more people see uh, our content also you can guarantee that you will see new uh podcasts new videos from ari by subscribing to the youtube channel and clicking the bell icon to get notifications when we go live or post a new video i uh, also sharing and and Liking the show on other forms of social media is appreciated. If you like what you see, uh, we appreciate your help in uh, making more people aware of this podcast. What else do we have? Um, right. Yeah, we, if you email us, our email address is newideal at einrand.org. Uh, you can send us comments, questions, feedback. Uh, we read all of the messages that we receive at this address and we respond to many of them. Uh, sometimes we've taken ideas from episodes from uh, email submissions and uh, we routinely do episodes where we answer your questions on objectivism. Um, so if you uh, submit your questions or comments to this address, uh, that's a great way to be in touch with us. Um, anything else, Ankar? Yeah, let's go. We had, we have, as you said, we got some super chat donations uh, and thanks for that. And let's, uh, I was lax in not looking at this during the podcast and we are a little over the hour, but if, if we, we'll take a couple of these in the clubhouse but someone asked about um, have public school districts resisted or objected to uh, here at the Ayn Rand Institute, one of our programs is to offer classroom sets of the novels to teachers who are interested, so particularly English teachers who are interested in teaching Ayn Rand's novels in uh, school. Have we got resistance to that? There's been one uh, like a little pockets of resistance of a particular uh, teacher or principal, but not any uh, significant resistance. And it is it's pretty much at, I think at the teacher can um, decide. Yeah, I want to. I'm going to teach these order the books. But there will be they get need to get for some district's approval and so on. But there's been no widespread resistance to that. So that's one of the super chat questions. And again, thanks for the donation. Great. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Ankar, for joining me today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we'll see some of you soon on Clubhouse. Thanks, Bye, Sam. everyone.